So um, good evening or good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, first session of a, of a two-session uh, two short course on um, simulation techniques and applications. I'm Scott Milner at Penn State University. And um, so before I forget, well, let me first of all say, please turn your cameras on and your microphones off because um, it's much nicer for me to see your faces. It um, feels like I'm talking to real people as opposed to just names on a screen. If you don't have a camera, I understand, you know, you, you can't turn on what you don't have. Um, but it's, uh, it's nice to know that you're out there. And, um, you know, if, if it weren't that, I'd have to make like a little row of stuffed animals or something behind, the, behind my laptop to, to talk to. Um, let's see, before I get too much further along, um, let me remember to, um, to thank some people. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Malgajata Kowalik, if I pronounce that correctly, Margaret, um, uh, Goska, I guess, also, for um, suggesting this short course and organizing it, for, for making it happen. Um, if, if not for her idea that it would be a good thing to do and persistence in, in organizing it, this wouldn't be taking place. And also thanks to the folks at, um, at uh, my local um, uh, research computing organization, ICDS, in particular, Lindsay Wells, for um, for providing the computational resources and the support necessary to make this possible. And, and finally, thanks to my PhD students, uh, Pooja Agarwala and Ritvik uh, Kali for, uh, to begin with, for, for testing the examples and finding several mistakes in my instructions, which would have been awkward and embarrassing had they not been caught. And, and more importantly, for agreeing to serve as assistants uh, during, the, um, during the exercises that we're gonna do. So I hope that everyone has um, made the changes that they need to make in their, um, in their bash RC file um, and, um, and also um, made a folder in which, to, um, in which to do the exercises. And um, if you haven't done that, I'll um, demonstrate that because I'm gonna do that uh, for myself uh, when the time uh, comes. Um, and let me just say a little bit about the, um, about the, uh, how should I put it, the logistics of the, of the Zoom meeting. Um, so as I've said, cameras on, mics off um, is helpful for me. If you have a question, since there's about 40 or so of you and therefore too many to fit on a single gallery screen, use the chat. Um, type in your question by chat, and I will eventually notice that the that the chat number has has gone up, and uh, and I'll be able to respond to questions most easily that way. You can also use the little hand raising button, um, and I will I will notice that as well. Um, as I mentioned before, the the um, the course will have um, some exercises, some some live examples and um, and for those after I present uh, what we're intended to do uh, we'll go to breakout rooms um, so that I and uh, and Margaret and Ritvik and Pooja can circulate around and help resolve uh, any questions um, that you might have. So um, so this short course is about as it says molecular dynamic simulation techniques and applications. Um, and uh, what are simulations or what are molecular dynamic simulations? Um, basically, we make movies of, of molecules moving around. And, um, and this picture that you're seeing here of the, uh, of the time scales and length scales covered by different kinds of simulational or computational methods um, tells you where molecular dynamics sits um, somewhere between um, between nanometers and, and, and a micron or so, and between picoseconds and a microsecond or so of, of simulating uh, things described atomistically. Um, so 
uh, much larger systems and much longer timescales than one can do with calculations that are quantum mechanically based. Um, much smaller systems and much shorter timescales then can be done um, by giving up the atomistic level of detail and coarse graining a system in a, in a variety of ways, which we'll touch on um, toward the end of, of the course. And so basically the recipe is simple. Uh, you describe molecules uh, with classical forces. So they're all pretend, they don't really come, you know, they're not quantum mechanical, but they're, you know, meant to, to approximate what the quantum mechanical forces are, um, both bonded and non-bonded between the different atoms in, um, in the molecules. And, um, and then you just solve uh, Newton's equations of motion for every atom and you, you know, uh, grind merrily forward in time. Um, as I say, making a movie of, of how the molecules move. And um, with that simple procedure, you can learn an awful lot about how matter behaves if you can figure out how to ask the question so that it fits into a micron and a microsecond. So, with that summary of what a simulation is, it's important to realize um, that the peculiar position uh, that, that simulations occupy in the, in the continuum from theory to experiment. And, and I would say, and this might be regarded as a somewhat controversial statement, that simulations are neither theory nor experiment. Well, it's not controversial to say that they're not experiment, but they, but they sure feel like it sometimes because you make these movies of, of the atoms moving around and it just, after a while, I mean, you, you, you look at them and you, you tend to believe in them a little more than you should. And, and, and you always have to remember that, you know, that it's not really, it's not really real. But what do I mean when I say it's not theory? Um, what I mean by that is it's not limited in the way that analytical theory is limited. In order to do analytical calculations or analytical slash numerical ones, ones that start with equations um, you have to make a lot of assumptions. You have to make a lot of approximations. You make a mean field type approximation or some other thing. Um, and, and a simulation in a certain sense allows you to relax those, those assumptions. It, it allows the molecules to move as they want to, you know, without you making assumptions about how they will move. Um, granted, you have to specify the force laws, but but, uh, but that's a, a, a much looser set of assumptions about how the matter that you're simulating will behave than one must necessarily make in analytical theory. Um, so that's a great virtue. Um, and that makes it possible to study many more systems and properties than, than you can really do um, with analytical uh, theory of, of the traditional kind. But as I say, just because you make a movie doesn't mean it's real. Um, doesn't mean that you know that what you are that your that your movie is representative of what actual molecules are, will do. And of course, you know one must must validate that against all kinds of checks that occur to you to make. I mean, clearly comparison against some experimentally measurable quantity, but also comparison against sort of internal consistency and common sense and and you know and one's knowledge of how the system must behave. Um, and so uh, I will share with you this, this definition of the word simulate. Um, imitate the appearance or character of, that sounds promising. Pretend to have or feel, you know, to simulate. And, and, and note the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the uh, what do you call them, the synonyms of feign, pretend, fake, sham, effect, put on, counterfeit. It doesn't sound so good. And then finally, produce a computer model of. Okay, so um, judge for yourself um, how, how much to, to believe in simulations, but, but they certainly are ubiquitous. And, and in some way, what makes the difference between a valuable simulation and, and just another simulation is the extent to which the simulators have first of all, thought about whether it corresponds to nature and, and, and the extent to which they, they validated that. And, that. and that part is work, um, not always thoroughly performed. So just something to think about as we, 
as we begin this topic. Um, so if you decide you're going to do simulations, as, as I did uh, more or less a year before, year or two before coming to Penn State uh, back in 2008, um, not having trained in this and not having you know, done, done research in it before, um, I decided that because um, I felt that coming to university that I would be able to approach a wider class of problems and work with a, 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 a broader class of students if, if that was the area I was working in rather than analytical theory, which is what I've done before. Um, then I found myself in, in the position of needing to choose a simulation platform, like what software are you going to use for, for doing this? Um, one wants to choose carefully. Uh, and, and I think it's worth, it's worth just thinking about what are some of the, um, the criteria. You know, how do you go about choosing a, a simulation platform? And there are, you know, a half a dozen well-developed uh, platforms uh, for doing um, molecular dynamic simulations. Um, so how do you choose? Well, you want one that's fast, you know, so a, a lot of effort has been invested in making it efficient. Um, I mean, you can solve Newton's equations um, efficiently or less so, depending on a lot of, of sort of low level tweaks and decisions that are made by armies of graduate students and postdocs who sweat blood to make these things go fast. So you want one that's fast. Um, you'd like it to be versatile so that you can do many different kinds of simulations and tweak the material that you're simulating in various ways. Um, you'd like it to have a, a good set of analysis tools. Eventually, you're going to have to write your own tools to, um, to ask questions about the trajectories. Not every single thing could be done with, a, you know, with stock tools that are provided. Nonetheless, many researchers before you will have asked similar questions. And so, you know, it leads to a set of analysis tools and how well thought out were they and how, you know, how many different things do you do with them uh, is an important question to ask. Um, there are commercial simulation packages, but clearly, you know, one wants to be working with an open source package because it, um, because it takes advantage of, of the enthusiastic labors of, of a community of like-minded folks who, who, you know, who love and value simulations and who are willing to, you know, contribute the hard work to make the platform, uh, better. And, um, and, and therefore, you know, you, you want one that's in active development. And, and finally, and I would say this is indicative and, and should be paid close attention to, you want one with a good manual. You know, I mean, because it saves you a world of pain. Um, if, if, you, if you're working with something, you're a neophyte and you're working something with something with a good manual, it is, it is worth a lot. So, all those things said, the choice I made, and this is not an advertisement, but merely a, a you know, a recounting of, of personal history, is, is um, Gromax, um, which was developed at, uh, at Groningen um, over some decades. And, um, and so that's the software that I've, I've used here. And this isn't meant to, to denigrate other choices, but just these were the things I thought about when I was making this choice. And one wants to choose carefully because you invest a lot of time in learning how to use the thing. And um, you know, if you're going to get into the business of doing simulations, so you want to choose carefully. So, um, versatile as the platforms are, there's a set of, of additional tools that one requires. And, and again, one you know, as a as a faculty member thinking about setting up a group, or you know, you're setting up your own research effort. Um, you want to think carefully about what, what are the additional tools you need and where are you going to get them and which ones are you going to take the trouble to learn how to use. And so the, uh, the ones you'll hear about here serve the following functions. Um, you, you need something to, to build molecules, that is to draw chemically realistic looking pictures of where atoms are, individual molecules that'll be used as the starting points for building configurations. And Gromax doesn't come with a builder. And, and uh, it is apparently a labor of love to build a, a decent molecule builder because non-commercial packages tend to have crummy builders. Uh, the exception to this in, in, my, uh, in, in my knowledge is 
is Avogadro, actually the previous version. There's an Avogadro 2, and, and the one you want is this one, um, is a really nice builder for molecules. And we rely on that quite heavily uh, for building um, single molecular structures for the most part. Um, you need something to look at the movies. So um, Gromax has a very primitive viewer of movies. Um, you need to look at the movies because you can learn a heck of a lot by looking at them and you can diagnose a lot of, of weird artifacts by, by looking at the movies. Um, it's, it's the first thing you should do basically every time, you know, when you're running a new kind of simulation is to look at the movie. Um, you can catch a lot of mistakes that way. And, and what we use for that purpose is VMD, um, which is, is really a user interface for, for the simulation package NAMD uh, built by folks at the University of Illinois. Um, and it's a great viewer and has a lot of other nice features and you'll, you'll use that a little bit in the, in the exercises um, this evening. Um, the third thing you need is something to plot your results. Um, so as a matter of workflow, Gromax produces um, data files that, uh, that you get once you analyze your trajectories. And, and those data files are, you know, it was decided, I guess, in the development of Gromax to write those in a form that, um, that was readable by a plotting package called XMGrace. And um, there are other, you know, Unix-based uh, command line type um, plotting packages. This one has a, a graphical user interface as well as being scriptable. And, and so it's, um, it's a nice choice and certainly simplifies the workflow for, for dealing with Gromax output and produces, you know, produces decent looking graphs. Um, so, um, so that's uh, an important tool to become familiar with. And, and finally, uh, and not open source, um, when, as we'll discuss later, you need to, um, to do quantum mechanical calculations to find out about um, the potential interactions between um, uh, inside molecules, usually like bond stretching potentials or angle bending potentials or what have you. Those calculations are done using, um, using quantum chemistry packages. And, and for this at Penn State, we um, take advantage of the fact that um, that we have a site license for something which otherwise would be rather expensive, um, which is Gaussian. And, and you won't use that in any exercises this evening, but I'll give an indication about how we use that in order to make um, realistic calculations for um, intramolecular potentials uh, when we need to. Um, so those are you know, some of the tools that, that one requires um, in addition to, to Gromax itself. So, um, so we'll begin with a discussion about a little more in detail of, of what a simulation actually consists of. How do you go about making movies of molecules? And, and if you think about it for, for a few minutes, you can, you can see that independent of, of uh, what computational platform you're using, that there's, there's several pieces that a simulation has to have. Um, no matter what platform it's done under, and, and other platforms will, will have equivalent structures or input files or what have you that, that serve these same functions. And so, you know, having heard about this platform, you know that if you went to look at another one, it would have to have stuff that did these, these same things. Um, basically four pieces. Um, first of all, the movie has a starting point. So there's an initial configuration right? Um, where are the atoms and particles at time zero? And in principle, how fast are they moving? Although if you're, if you're doing a simulation at finite temperature, you might very well just generate the velocities according to a Maxwell distribution. Uh, but you, you for sure have to say where everybody is to start with. Um, so you have to build an initial configuration. And, and sometimes, as we'll discuss, that's actually uh, non-trivial. Um, quite a lot of work and, and, and involves a certain amount of cleverness. But in any case, you've got to specify the initial condition, the initial configuration, and there's a file that you know says where everything is. Um, the next thing you need is is a force field or a potential. In other words, the rules for computing the forces on all the atoms. 
okay? And, and that's a big deal when you're talking about chemically realistic simulations with real molecules, because you've got a bunch of different kinds of atoms um, and you've got, you know, bond and angle and dihedral potentials and bonded and non-bonded potentials. And just to write that down is, is pretty complicated. So how exactly do you specify that? And, and this is a place where you rely very heavily on the work of others. That is, there are potentials, meaning sets of these force field rules that have been developed by, again, armies of grad students and postdocs who sweat blood over these things. Um, several different such classes of potentials. Um, and, and we'll use one of them called OPLS, which I'll say more about uh, in a little bit uh, for the simulations that we do. And, and the, the choice of potential is a somewhat independent thing from the choice of simulation platform. In other words, there's nothing about Gromax that says that it can only use a certain, uh, certain potential, even though the developers of Gromax uh, tend to focus on, on their particular potential that they've helped very much to develop. But in any case, you need rules for computing the forces. And you often find that you need to extend those some because, um, because there's lots of different kinds of molecules and, and maybe your particular little, uh, little molecular group won't be well described by, by force laws that people have already worked out. Anyway, that's the second piece of, of the simulation. Um, the third thing is, is what in Gromax language anyway is called a topology file which basically means how are the molecules connected up together? Where are the bonds? And, um, and, and therefore, what um, kinds of atoms do you have? What kinds of bonds are present? You know, what are, this, what, are the, the, uh, what kind of angle forces are present? What kinds of dihedral potentials are present? All those come from the connectivity of the molecule. And, and that's why this file is, is somewhat um, misleadingly in a way, although I can't necessarily think of a better name, uh, called the topology file. It's a descriptor of each molecule in your, each kind of molecule in your simulation that tells how it's hooked up, what kind of atoms are present, what kinds of intramolecular interactions are present, what the sort of properties of those atoms are. Um, and the final thing that you have to tell the simulation is what to do. Um, what are the run parameters? You know, how long do you want to run? How, what's the temperature? Do you have temperature control? Um, is this a constant volume or a constant pressure simulation? What's the time step? How often do you want to take data? Stuff like that. Um, those are run parameters. And, and so, you know, one clearly has to have a file that specifies uh, those things. So these are the are the four pieces, which as I say, it's, it's clear after a few minutes thought that, that any simulation platform has got to have these elements somehow or other. Does anybody have any questions at this point? I, the chat is, is silent, I think. No, no chats. Well, I'll, I'll encourage a question by just taking a sip of, of coffee. Actually, this is empty. This is completely fake, but. Okay, well, don't hesitate to, to break in. Um, if, if, and, and, and the, indeed, using the chat to break in is meant to be a low barrier, right? You don't really have to interrupt. Just type a, type a question and, and it should eventually come to my attention that there's a that there's a chat. Okay. Um, so let's look a little bit more in detail at what these what these in, inputs look like for the particular case of, of Gromax. So for example, um, configuration files which tell you know where the atoms are. Um, so here's um, a picture of decane. And, um, and two different kinds of configuration files that are of interest to us are um, on the lower left, the kind that Avogadro builds, um, which is uh, the configuration for one molecule. And it's called a PDB file. It stands for protein data bank um, because it's the format in which uh, protein structures determined by X-ray crystal, uh, crystallography are, are, um, are stored or archived. Um, 
And, and what you can see is that, you know, with some header information, basically it's a list of atoms. Um, there are atom numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's atom names, you know, C1, which clearly means the first carbon, H11 is the first hydrogen attached to that, blah, blah, blah. Um, the residue name, which in this case is PEB, which we made up, which stands for polyethylene beginning. And then there's the XYZ positions. And down at the bottom, um, there's information about what atoms connected to what. And that's a file that gets made um, by Avogadro and, and fiddled around with by us. Um, on the upper right is, is you know, what a configuration file looks like um, that's input to Gromax called a Gro file, which just stands for Gromax. Um, it's useful to, to bear in mind what these file extensions stand for because they all stand for something. And, and if you remember what they are, it helps you know what that file is supposed to do. Um, so this one here, again, is a list of X, Y, Z uh, positions and also velocities as it happens um, for the different atoms. And they're all you know, in order um, from the beginning you know, to the end, one molecule after another. This is, is, a, um, is a melt of, of 3,200 uh, atoms, which is however many chains of, of poly of, of decane that it is. Um, and I'd have to think for a minute to figure that out. But, um, you know, there's a picture of the, of the melt that it is over there on the lower right. So, um, so the file's simple. Um, the file format couldn't be simpler. It's just a list of the atom positions and, and where everything is. Um, building it, on the other hand, is um, can be kind of a nuisance, and we'll talk about that more um, tomorrow. Um, but just as, just to think about it for a minute, um, if you have a crystal, if you were simulating a crystal, which is not typically what you do with molecular dynamic simulations, although you can. I mean, molecular crystals are more interesting because they have more motion in them, right? If you have, you know, a, um, a crystal, you know, made of rather weakly associating molecules, it's got interesting competition between energy and entropy. Anything that's, you know, tightly covalently bonded is not a very interesting MD simulation. Um, but if you have a crystal and you know what the structure is, then building it is just stacking up stuff where it's supposed to go, right? I mean, all the atom positions are known and you know it fits together because it's a crystal and, and you know, that you know the structure. So that's not so hard. Um, Building a liquid out of roundish molecules is not so bad either. And Gromax has tools for that, which basically just randomly insert molecules and keep trying until they achieve roughly the density that you want to be at. They don't necessarily make the most beautiful arrangement that way, okay? But you know, you get a pretty good arrangement and you can relax it later. And anyway, it gets to the right density just by more or less inserting stuff. You can see that if molecules are big, and funny shaped, like sticks, for example, or polymers, um, this is not gonna work well. You will have a hard, hard time achieving liquid-like density with just randomly, blindly inserting molecules into space. That won't work, and we do a different thing uh, as a consequence. Um, if you wanna make a solution, okay, well, really, that's just a liquid with, you know, if it's a solution of roundish things, like salt water, which is what the picture is on the right, um, then, you know, you can make it by first making water and then you maybe some replace some of the water molecules with sodium or chlorine, which is about the same size. Uh, and so it's not too hard to make a credible looking salt solution, which again, you know, is going to need to be um, sort of relaxed um, to, uh, and, and, and then equilibrated. Uh, but if, if what you want to build is something self-assembled, uh, like a bilayer, for example. So on the left there is drawn, um, you know, a set of, of, of oligomeric polymer dye block copolymers. One, the blue one likes water and the red one doesn't. And so this thing will tend to self-assemble into a bilayer, um, but not a crystal. The thing that it really self-assembles into, a snapshot of it's on the right. That's hard to build, basically impossible to build by, by fiat, right? Because it's ordered, okay, because the molecules tend to point in the normal direction, but it's disordered. 
and and they're polymers so you can't stick them in at random because they'll land on each other every single time and you'll get some crazy high energy um, so how the heck do you build a thing like that well the answer is you build a more ordered thing and then let it relax okay let the simulation in other words build the structure from something that knows about the symmetry of the of the built object but doesn't try to get the details right and, and that's a tricky thing to do um, and actually this is a snapshot from from some of the work of, of my PhD student Ritvik Kali who's who's serving in as, as an assistant um, in the short course here so we'll, we'll you'll actually hear some more about just very briefly about about the work that this is a part of um, later in the in the course So, um, so that's just a few more remarks about, about initial configurations. Building them is difficult, and we'll talk about, about how one goes about building, for example, a disordered uh, polymer-ish liquid um, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening or morning, depending on, on where you are. Um, so let's say a little bit more about the force fields. Um, and you remember that I said at the beginning that these are, you know, we're, we're using classical mechanics and therefore what we call classical force fields. There's nothing quantum mechanical about it, though we're trying to represent the forces that would come from real quantum mechanics, and they are necessarily approximate. Um, first of all, the real potential is some horrible multi-body thing that, you know, where all the atom positions matter all at the same time. And that you know, you write that down and then you shudder and, and, and immediately approximate it. Um, and so uh, the first approximation you make is to say that we have a sum of bonded terms and non-bonded terms. And the bonded terms are the ones that, you know, correspond to bonds and angles and dihedrals and stuff in a given molecule. And the non-bonded ones, okay, we likewise approximate um, as the sum of Coulomb interactions, that's pretty straightforward as long as we're happy with, you know, representing the charge on an atom, which is really a fuzzy quantum mechanical thing as a point. Okay. And then Leonard Jones interactions, which is our approximation to, on the one hand, um, dispersive attractions at far distances. And on the other hand, um, repulsions that come when you try to make anything overlap with anything when you make it be too close, which, you know, quantum mechanically comes from, from Pauli exclusion. Um, but here is just, you know, phenomenologically a repulsive potential. Um, so we've approximated then the non-bonded interactions as being always pairwise um, and indeed always central forces between, between atoms. And, and that, that, is a hard, that is a hard approximation to relax, an expensive approximation to, to relax and is very rarely uh, relaxed in, in most atomistic MD simulations. Um, right, just as a remark about the Coulomb interactions, um, even neutral molecules, you know, you should think of as, as having charges on the atoms, okay? Partial charges, we would call them. So a water molecule is neutral, right? But, but you know that it has a big dipole, okay? And so if you're gonna assign charges to the oxygen and the, carb and, and the hydrogens, you're going to assign a negative charge to the oxygen. You're going to assign positive charges to the hydrogens um, to represent something about its electrostatic interaction with its neighbors. And how one goes about making that assignment, we'll talk about later. But it, even neutral molecules, right, have locally positive and negative bits, and those things interact pairwise, you know, with with Coulomb interactions in the simulation, and thereby you know, representing some of the reality of, of how these molecules interact with each other. Okay. Um, so the topology file, now it starts to get complicated. Um, how do you go about specifying the force field and who's connected to what and so forth? So um, this, is, this is a messy business. Uh, the first thing is it, it has kind of a top-down structure. So there's a file called the top file for topology and the whole system that you're simulating has one. And so here's a, an example, indeed an example from the first exercise you're gonna do 
Um, and you see it starts with some include files, which are kind of like the include in, a, you know, in C++, right? It reads in like, you know, it's like in a courtroom when they say, you know, read that into the record, right? So this file says, okay, first read in the force field file, then read in a file that describes the water model called single point charge extended water, SPCE, then read in the file that describes the ions, and then read in the ITP, this stands for input topology file of the thing of the molecule we're simulating, which is a protein called 1AKI. Um, and then name the system and then tell how many molecules of every kind we have. And there's one protein and upwards of 10,000 waters and eight chlorine ions to balance the charge on the protein. And so that's the structure of the topology file, simple enough. Um, if you go poking around into it and say, well, okay, but what's in those files? What's in this force field file? Well, it doesn't look like much. Um, it reads in some defaults and then it reads in two other files, FF non-bonded and FF bonded. Okay, well, that sounds like probably that's telling me something about the, the non-bonded and bonded interactions. Um, well, okay, what about that ITP file of the, of the molecule? Um, that's where you start specifying really how the molecules hooked up and making those files is hard. Um, and we have various techniques for doing it, but just to give you an idea about what's in it. So here's one for decane. It's got a certain number of atoms in it. I have only included the first you know, the first CH3 and CH2 group and dot, 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 there's more. And then there's a whole list of bonds. One's bonded to two, two's bonded to three, three's bonded to four and so on, right? And a whole long list of angles and a whole long list of dihedrals and so on. So that'd be kind of a mess to make by hand. Um, you could do it. Um, and, um, as I say, it's called an input topology file. So every molecule in your system needs one of these things. Every distinct kind of molecule needs one of these things. Um, and all that hard work that was done by all those grad students and so on who, who figured out the interactions um, between the different kinds of atoms is stored in those files we haven't yet looked at, which are part of the OPLS, that is optimized potentials for liquid simulations. Um, and it starts with a big long list of different kinds of atoms in different circumstances. Okay, it's not enough to just say it's carbon atom. You gotta know, is it a carbon atom on a CH3 or carbon atom on a CH2 or what? And so here's a tiny little piece of the list of all the different kinds of atoms referring to the pieces that appear in alkanes and alkenes. And then in the non-bonded file, what you have is basically the list of the Leonard Jones parameters for those, the sigma and the epsilon, where the Leonard Jones interaction is this. And these specify the interactions for the different atoms, as well as their partial charges. And so you can see that there being so many different chemical circumstances, okay, in which a carbon atom could find itself, that this is going to be a long file and necessarily incomplete. Um, you know, some molecule that you're interested in just may not have, you know, may have structures in it that never appeared in, in, um, in molecules that people, you know, were interested in before. And if you want to know about the interaction of, of different atoms via Leonard Jones, there are reasonably theoretically defended mixing rules for how the strength of interaction and repulsive length scale of, of unlike pairs should depend on these values assigned for the pairs. And that gives you a, a good guess for what the interaction is for the n squared pairs from only n numbers, okay? And, and that's a good thing because otherwise this file would be really long, um, unmanageably long. Um, likewise, the, the FF bonded lists the bond strengths, um, the, so, so for example, for a, for a bonded interaction between two um, alkane carbons, well, it's got a length of, of about one and a half angstroms or 0.15 nanometers and a spring constant of thus and such in, in Gromax units, which are kilojoule per mole per nanometer squared. Um, and every different kinds of spring is in there in that, 
I mean, all, all the ones that they've you know, worked out are in there someplace and likewise angles and dihedrals. So um, if all of those interactions are in there for your molecule, you know, lucky you, and then, and then you, know, you, can, you can basically just reference those and, and go as, as soon as you've built your, your molecule ITP file. Um, if not, then you have to figure out how to augment those in a sensible and, and consistent way. So that's what's under the hood. Um, you know, not the most interesting part, but absolutely necessary in order to do atomistic simulations. So finally, um, the, uh, the parameter MDP file, MD parameter file is what MDP stands for, that runs the simulation, tells it what to do. And this is a, a free form file of keywords and, and values, which it behooves you to organize in a, in a sensible way. And so this is, is my organization of this. There are certain things that, that control the, the run, basically what kind, of, what kind of run am I doing? You can do MD, but other things too, like energy minimization or stochastic dynamics. So the integrator, that's saying, what kind, of, what kind of evolution am I doing? What's my time step? All important question, because you wanna run as fast as you can, but if you take too big a time step, bad things happen and the system um, quote unquote blows up about which more tomorrow. Um, how many steps do I wanna take is how long am I gonna run? Um, how often do I take output? Um, what am I doing about cutting off the interactions? In order to make simulations efficient, you have to choose a length for the cutoff at which point you, you ignore interactions that are weak and distant. And so there's a whole story about this. Um, Coulomb interactions you handle using um, sort of combination of real space and Fourier space methods so that you're not really cutting anything off because if you did, um, you'd make pretty bad mistakes because Coulomb interactions don't converge very well. I mean, they, they only die off as one over R, although when you have you know, mixtures of positive and negative charges, then, then mostly you only have things with high multiples interacting and their fields fall off a lot faster. Um, but Coulomb interactions are twitchy and, and you don't wanna cut them off if, if you don't have to. Um, temperature control, you typically are running a simulation at at a finite temperature and, and that's accomplished by um, every once in a while adjusting the velocities a little bit up or a little bit down in order to control the mean kinetic energy. Um, and so here are the parameters for dealing with that. And pressure control, which every once in a while changes the size of the box a little bit um, in order to have, um, to have the, the, the pressure uh, correct. Um, so these, these parameters are, are things that, well, you need to know what values to put in here. And you might wonder, God, I got a whole page of these things. What, what do I choose? And, and the short answer is you adapt it from something that works. <laughs> um, these are not things that you necessarily estimate. I mean, so these cutoff values, you know, it's, it's sort of known from experience what kind of values uh, give reasonable results without causing you to run too slowly because the bigger you make the cutoff, the, uh, the more interactions that you have to calculate in order to calculate the force on a, on a given atom and then the slower your simulation is gonna go. Um, what kind of time step can I get away with? Well, it's the same sort of thing. If you, if you take too small a time step, you know, then the simulation works fine, but nothing moves. Uh, if you take too big a time step, then molecules that are approaching each other in a collision will tend to approach too much. And then they go into the repulsive potential further than they should go and then they come flying off and basically they've got more energy than they should have had. And then they go whamming into somebody else and it gets worse and worse. And so the energy goes climbing up and then you know you're in trouble. Um, so we tend to copy these files as you will do uh, in, in examples um, from ones that work and, and to modify them you know, as little as possible. So that's the guts of, of what's in these things. And, and again, I'm gonna pause uh, for questions um, because the next thing we're gonna do is, is actually run, go through the, the steps of, of running uh, a simple simulation.
for which line by line instructions have been provided and checked by, by Ritvik and Puja, um, each of whom found mistakes in the, in the, in the, uh, in the line by line um, uh, uh, instructions. So any questions? Um, just a simple one for the PDB file. Uh, the residue is just a molecule identifier, right? The, the PDB file uh, that the, the PDB files that we are interested in are typically for single molecules. And Romax has facilities for, has utilities for assembling those into a, into a uh, configuration file for a whole system. It can do things like stack them or insert them in places that you say. And, and so there's various tools for building up a larger configuration from these single molecule PDB files. But it doesn't have a thing for building PDB files that has the kind of chemical knowledge that, that ChemDraw or Avogadro or something has that knows when you stick a hydrogen on a carbon to make it go this far off in this angle. Um, okay, yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, so I know that um, traditional MD, you define bonds, but reacts FF um, automatically makes or breaks bonds. Where is something like that specified? Um, so reacts FF is a special thing um, and um, much more audacious uh, than, than, uh, than classical MD in that it is in effect trying to recapitulate chemistry not just uh, motion, right? No bonds are ever broken in classical MD simulations. The, the molecule ITP file specifies bonds and they are permanent. Um, the advantage of that is that it runs like, I don't know, a thousand or 10,000 times faster. And, and you, can, you, know, you can do simulations with classical MD, uh, or to put it a different way, if you do REACTS FF or, or such simulations, you are much more limited in the size of the system and the length of time that you can run because of, uh, of the you know, much more complicated potential with breakable bonds. Thank you. But so it, it would be something in the uh, force field file? Um, well, yeah, the force field file is immensely more complicated uh, in, um, uh, in, um, in REACTS FF than, than in any kind of classical MD. Speaking, um, not to run over you, but speaking of someone who does LAMPs, there are some simulations people do where they will take a classically bonded potential and you can add on LAMPs as things called fixes where you can break or create bonds depending on molecules positions in an attempt to add some simulation of reactivity to a traditional simulation, but that's. Yes, um, and, and you, 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 you pick your battles very carefully. I mean, you choose those bonds which you make breakable or, or, or not, yeah. Um, and, and you know, and that kind of thing is very valuable, but it's, it's not, I mean, um, Reacts FF is, is basically much more, any bond is breakable. Um, and, and that's expensive. Um, let's see, there were a couple of questions on the chat. So uh, Kirti asks um, whether the MDP files stay similar for every kind of simulation or will it drastically change for, for something like a biphasic system or, or what have you. Um, they certainly change and, and you'll see, you know, you'll see examples of, of the ways in which they change. I mean, the, the, the basic categories are, are you doing constant pressure or not. Um, and uh, sometimes you, you allow the system to, to adjust its area in the transverse direction, but not in the vertical direction or things like that. So there, there are things like that. Um, there are different categories of, of simulation in which you can take bigger or smaller time steps. And there are reasons uh, to be more or less aggressive with the cutoffs. But the categories of settings that I have shown here are kind of the basic ones. When you get to tweaking, that is uh, what I mean by uh, perturbing the system, applying forces and things, then there's a whole different category of, of, of specifications in the MDP file. Essentially, what am I pulling on? How hard am I pulling? Which direction am I pulling? You know, what potential am I, what external potential am I applying? All the things you can do to, 
to pull on, poke at, and otherwise tweeze um, the system. And that's a whole different category of stuff that we mostly are not going to talk about here, except as an example uh, tomorrow evening. Um, Let's see. The other, Sherrod asks, if there's no available details for a particular kind of atom, or uh, how does the simulation handle that? It doesn't handle it. You have to handle it. You have to figure out what the rules are for that thing to interact with other atoms before you ever get started. And we'll talk about that in about an hour. Anybody else? Okay, so um, we're gonna run a simulation and I want to, um, to first go over what we're gonna do and then I'll put everybody in breakout rooms um, so that we can um, help resolve any difficulties that you have in doing it. Now, if there's anybody who hasn't yet um, made themselves a folder in which to work, um, Looks like there's more folders than there used to be. Um, so I've got one here, but it's empty. And I'm going to copy the tarball um, into my folder. And CD in there. Whoops, CD in there. And then unpack it. Right. Um, so the structure of the of these, there's four examples that we're going to look at, and each example's got its folder. And the first one is going to be this lysozyme example. And so there's three folders in there. Um, start is the one which starts the the exercise. Um, ready to run is everything that you need to do in terms of supplying files and all that needs to be done that remains is to actually run the simulation and completed is what it looks like when the simulation is done. Um, so if you have difficulties, then, you know, then you can shift over to, to the ready to run or, or completed file. Um, that's the, that's the theory anyway. Um, so now, let me go over kind of what we're going to do here. So, um, so lysozyme is a protein and it has a PDB file because it's stored in the protein data bank. And what we need to do is to take that file and turn it into a molecule ITP file. And because Chromex was developed by people interested in biochemistry uh, and biophysics, there's a lovely tool for doing that called PDB2GMX. Um, and, and what it does is it takes advantage of the fact that proteins are built out of amino acids uh, and, um, and is thereby able to create a topology file by using that information. And so the command for that, all Gromax commands start with GMX, um, and then the actual command um, is, is written there, GMX, PDB to GMX. The input file, F, is the PDB file. The output file is the configuration file, a grow file. And the P, the topology file, is, is the, the molecule topology file, um, which when it comes out of PDB to GMX is a, is a complete system topology file. So what we will do is, is do a little editing of it um, on, the, um, on the next slide, I think. Uh, I believe, maybe not, maybe not on this one. Um, yeah, no, no, never mind. Um, so then you have to, um, no, that surely I have to edit this thing. Sorry, I'm just running back and forth like a chipmunk across the road. Um, we need to make this grow file a little bit bigger. 
um, that is to extend the boundaries on the sides of the thing so that there'll be room for enough water that it stays away from its periodic images. That's what that next command is for, the gmx edit conf. And you'll notice right away that, you know, Gromax commands are all command line commands. This is not a graphical user interface program, right? Which means it's scriptable. Um, that's, you know, so it's old school, right? But it's, it's, it's Unix philosophy. And so you can put the, you know, commands together in scripts in a much more convenient way than if it were, uh, than if it did have a GUI, which it does not. Um, so we added the configuration to center the protein. That's what the C is for. To add a boundary of, of a nanometer, that's what the hyphen D is for. Um, and then you need to create this system topology file by simply typing this in um, to the text to a text editor. Okay. So if you're if you're comfortable in VI, use that. If not, um, the the editor G Edit is available and will pop open a um, you know, a, uh, a visual uh, mouse and cursor and, and, and menu type editor to create this, uh, to create this system.pop file. Um, as I mentioned, and as, as you received an email, line by line instructions of, of what you're supposed to do are, are included there. Um, so I'm going to, um, to just go ahead and skip to the next slide because you do have uh, copies of the of the line by line instructions. Um, so then, what you have is a naked protein in there that you have to add some water to, and there's a tool called Solvate, which which accomplishes this. Um, it puts solvent water around the protein, and so the first thing is the is the configuration of the protein, but you can solvate things that aren't proteins. So CP. Um, and then the configuration of the solvent, which is a little box of, of equilibrated water that it kind of sneaks in wherever there's space. And the output of that, the hyphen O, is the solvated profile. And, uh, and it updates the, the system topology file um, according to how many waters it's stuck in there. And then because this protein's charged, we need to add some counter ions. And so, um, to do that, we, um, it turns out we first have to actually pretend that we're going to do a run to produce something called a topology run file, a TPR file. And so we run GROMP, which is the GROMAX preprocessor. And the input of that is, is kind of a, a little minimal MDP file, a configuration and a topology file, the three things that you need in order to get a run started. And then it builds for you the topology run file, which is basically everything that, that MD run actually needs to run. Only we don't run anything. It's just a quirk of Gromax that the thing that puts ions in in place of water needs a topology run file. So we create one and then we use gen ion and hand it the topology run file, the grow file with the protein and the water, the system topology file. We tell it the names of the ions we want and then we tell it we want n. We tell it we want eight anions, so the number of negative uh, charged ions. And it finds eight waters and sticks them in there. Um, so you see the sort of you begin to see this the the kind of workflow of of Gromax is to use these different um, utilities in sequence to modify the files in the direction that you need in order to build uh, the system. So um, the next thing that we do after we've, we've done that is to actually equilibrate the system in, because I, you know, we, we put this protein in and we put water around it, but maybe not in a very nice place. And so we equilibrate it in three steps, which are energy minimization, just to get everything sort of in a local energy minimum. Um, we then do a short simulation at fixed volume and temperature. Uh, and then we, we typically would do a simulation at fixed pressure and temperature and thereby achieve something which was more representative of, of an actual uh, arrangement of molecules. So, um, so this is probably a good place to, to switch over to, um, to actually carrying out the, um, the, the line by line instructions. 
um, which, uh, let's see. Which you can see here, right? Yeah. Um, so this starts from this boulder lysozyme start. And so you want a CD to there. And then, um, and then you execute this command here for, um, for converting the, the PDB file to a topology file. And that's an interactive program. It'll prompt you for a choice of the force field that you wanna use for which the correct answer is uh, 15, I think, which corresponds to the OPLS all atom force field, the one that we're using. And then it will ask you whether you want a, uh, what kind of water, mo water model you want, that is what sort of model potential. And, and the answer we want here is none, because we're gonna supply our own in the, in the, um, in the uh, topology file that we're gonna build. Um, so go ahead and do that. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Actually, I might even just cut and paste this command because I would like to avoid having typos in front of everyone. Oh, but, ha, huh, but cut and paste doesn't work that way. Let's see, command, nope. That's just cruel. It must be paste on this silly thing. There's uh, a small need... arrow on the left of your screen. The small arrow on the left, <laughs> near <laughs> trash. V. This small arrow yeah, yeah. allows and me to paste. The, yes, just click on that clipboard. Oh, I don't know, uh, like I do it that way. I'm gonna type it myself if that's <laughs> what I gotta do. Yeah. Um, thank you though. Um, Can you just highlight it and then middle click? That usually works on most Unix things. I don't know if it works inside the vertical. I, you know, I thought so. You say highlight it over here and then what? And then just middle mouse click it? No. Nope. So the cluster is on a different computer that doesn't share the clipboard. So you need to use yeah. the arrow mark. Yeah, well, or I will just, I hope I can shrink this thing without totally wrecking everything, yes. And then put this over here where I can see it. You should all be doing this. Not good. Oh, of course I'm, <laughs> yeah, good start. Um, right, and so here it's, it's you know, prompting you for the choice of, of um, force field. And so for that one we want, oh, not, not 15, but 16, hmm. Wonder why. It was 15 for me. 15 for you. Um, some different, uh, some tiny difference in my bash RC file as opposed to yours. Um, when that works, then you get a bunch of new files. And the topology file that you make um, has a little bit more in it than we want because we want a molecule ITP file, not the whole thing. So I'm going to um, edit that and take off stuff down to the part where it defines a molecule type. So And I want to call this something else, one uh, AKI, I think. And then I want to go down to the bottom and strip out the stuff here that defines a system and so on, which again would be a system topology uh, file type uh, thing. So, like so. And everything else is fine. 
And so I'll uh, rename this as um, ITP to indicate that it's an input topology file. And then um, I want to um, modify the grow file that it made to make it a little bit bigger and center it and so forth. Um, and then type in this topology file and solve eight and so on. So I'm gonna set you loose in, in breakout rooms to work on this for the next, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. We'll see how it goes. Um, let's see, how many people we got here? Uh, six rooms, six people. Okay. Um, So there's a call button and if you need help, um, just hit the call button and, um, and anyway, we'll circulate around and, and say hello and see how you're doing. So I, um, I shut down the breakout rooms because I, was, uh, I had the sense, although it's a little hard for me to, um, to uh, um, quantitatively assess it, that most people had finished getting their molecules solvated. Is that correct? Electronic thumbs or, or human thumbs? Um, okay, good. Um, and, and, that, uh, and that a fair number of people had little problems, you know, like ah, I didn't rename my molecule or oh, I forgot to delete the bottom of this file or oh, there was a typo or oh, oh, there was a typo in the instructions that says hyphen CL when it was supposed to say CL for the, for the anion name. Um, welcome to, to, you know, welcome to simulations. Um, that's the downside of text-based programs, right? They're very fiddly in terms of, you know, you've got to say the right thing. And so it's important to build kind of a, you know, an internal mental model of the, of the syntax, right? You know, it's, it's regular, but it's unforgiving. And, and so, you know, you, 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 get, you get to where that kind of thing happens less frequently, but that, that is part of, part of the reality. Um, Anyway, good for you for hanging on this much. And um, what we want to go forward and do is, um, is launch the simulations. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again and, um, and just uh, point out what the next uh, steps are. Let's see. So as I said, we equilibrate in, in three steps. And, and basically what we're trying to do is to, 
is to take a simulation initial condition that's not that representative of what real molecules would do. And we're trying to gentle it into a configuration that's much more representative of, of what a liquid would do. And a liquid, if you think about it, is a pretty weird structure. I mean, it's very dense, but it's not ordered. And the molecules are kind of picky about exactly how they sit next to each other. And if you put them a little too close, they have a huge repulsive interaction. So they're, you know, they're just sort of gentled against each other. And try as you might with solvating things, you're not necessarily going to build something very, um, very representative. Uh, and so that's why um, you have to um, gentle them in, so to speak, first with an energy minimization and then whoops, and then with um, a, uh, a short uh, period of, of NVT simulation, and then, you know, give the chance, give the system a chance to adjust its, its uh, volume um, with an NPT simulation. And so each of those steps, um, compared actually to the building that you just went through, each of those steps is pretty straightforward uh, once someone has supplied for you um, the appropriate MDP files, okay? And so here uh, on this page are the, are the instructions. You know, you, for every time you do a simulation, you run GROMP, which stands for Gromax Preprocessor. And it takes the MDP file, the initial configuration, the system topology file, and produces this topology run file, okay? And, and remember these, these these subs, uh, what do you call them, file extensions, okay, knowing what they mean is helpful to understand, do I have the right ingredients, you know, put together in the right way. So input files, the MDP, the configuration, that's hyphen C, the topology file, topology file, I don't know why it's not T, but it isn't, um, is, is hyphen uh, P, and then the output is the topology run file. And then you run the simulation, and Although you could specify the names of all of the input files that the, uh, that the MD run is looking for, conveniently you can just tell it with defnum, which means define name, EM, everything you're looking for and everything you're going to be make is going to be called EM something, right? So it's EM.MDP, EM.TPR, and, and indeed the output files will be similarly named. So that's to avoid messing up. Um, and then once you've run the energy minimization, you'll have a, a final grow file, a configuration that that thing makes called em.grow. And that will be the starting point for the MDP, for, for, sorry, the starting point for the NVT simulation. And so you, you gromp that thing with its MDP file, nvt.mdp. You give it the configuration from energy minimization. You give it the same topology file and out comes the topology run file for the NVT run, which you then um, could run from the command line with another MD run. This one, however, will take about 20 minutes or so with the resources that you have. And so instead what we do is we submit that thing to the queue um, with the command Q sub. We have a script, uh, nvt.sh, uh, and that script simply asks for resources from the queue and executes a GMX MD run. Um, and so that thing gets submitted to the batch queue and runs when it runs. And as I say, it will take about 20 minutes. You can check on that job with qstat hyphen u, your user ID to see whether it's running or queued or what have you. And, and when it finishes, you can ask the configuration questions. Uh, for example, there's an energy data uh, run file, which is, is produced sort of um, like, how should you put it, diagnostic data on the simulation, like energy versus time, temperature versus time, pressure versus time. And you can ask for those things with the command GMX energy, producing a thing that you can then plot. Um, so what we'll do then is, is run the energy minimization and the NVT runs and submit those. And then while they're running, we can talk about or do something else. Um, so these are the, th the steps that one wants to do next. Um, and uh, let's see, as you can see, all these things have names. Um, 
and just one other comment about you know what you can see while a job is running. If you're impatient, you can look at the log file that the that MD run makes. And it is giving a little printout every once in a while, depending on what you specified for, for how often to give an entry to the log of what's the energy, what's the pressure and so on. And this allows you, if you look at it, to see trouble. Like if the energy goes shooting up, trouble. If the, if the pressure is some you know, crazy value, trouble, um, that kind of thing. When the run is done, the bottom of the log file gives useful information about um, the run, most uh, including how much time was taken doing various stuff. And what you hope to find is that almost all of the time was spent calculating forces, because that's the expensive part of a simulation. Um, and then the, the final, final thing is that it tells you how long the job took and how many nanoseconds of simulation time per day of real time you're getting. And this is a measure of the efficiency of the, of the run. And, and we'll have more to say about that uh, later. In terms of what's in the script file, here's a very simple example. Those comments at the top of the script file are requests to the batch queue for resources. What account am I running under? How many nodes do I want? How many processors on that node? How much time do I want? Um, and then I change directory into the directory where I was when I submitted the job. That's what that CD PBS O work dear does. And then you just do the same command you would have done at the command line, GMX MD run, and then the NT4 is requesting four threads, which matches the four cores that are asked for in the, uh, in the resources above. And so that's the simplest possible job script. And the advantage is just it doesn't tie up um, the, your terminal or, and, and work with the sort of limited resources you get when you log on interactively. It, it uses multiple cores available to batch jobs. So that's... Um, more or less the structure of, of what we're doing. And um, let's see, I didn't mean to stop share so much as I meant to stop the slideshow. So let me turn the share back on. And so now um, what we are doing is this part of the, of the, um, of the uh, exercise, right? Doing this minimization, which you do interactively, that's pretty fast. Um, although for bigger systems, one might wanna do it in a script. Um, and then uh, run the gromp on the, M on the MBT and submit that to the queue. Um, so I don't think I need to put you in breakout rooms while you do that, um, but let's just take a moment and do that. and I'm gonna refresh my coffee. So I'll be back in a couple of minutes.
any questions at this point? Um, if you have a question, either as you choose, raise your hand, speak up, or send a chat. Hi, uh, Dr. Milner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, can you clarify the gen ion co command again? Oh, are we, are, are you back at that? Um, yeah, I just. Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the uh, it's this thing highlighted um, here and it needs this gromp run beforehand. Um, if you're still having trouble with that, but you want to go ahead and run the simulation, you can switch over to the folder called ready to run. Uh, okay. And then um, you can certainly just do this okay. uh, gromp and MD run command, I think should be fine from in there. Uh, let's see. Um, So let me just verify that. I will do the same thing. I just need to make this a little smaller so I can see it. Whoops. Okay, so my gromp worked, as you can see. And then I can go ahead and do the, uh, the uh, energy minimization by invoking um, MD run. And this will dump its output to the screen, which is you know not normally what you do with a big run, but here, I mean, you can see what kind of output it, it produces. Of course, you could catch this in a file if you wanted to see it by redirecting it into a file um, in the usual kind of way. But here it will just, um, it'll just output the different, uh, the different steps as it goes along. Uh, Dr. Miller? Yeah. Uh, I had a question. So the number of water molecules or the solvent molecules that are added in one of the commands. Yes. If you look at the system.pop file that was there in the ready to run directory, it was different from what we were, when we were executing the command were coming out to be. Hmm. So I wanted to ask, is there a way we specify that number or is it just- It specified it uh, when it did the insertion and there might be something a little bit random about that. That is, you might not get the same thing every time. Um, and um, so when I set this thing up um, before, you know, it, it may not give exactly the same answer because of some random element of the choosing of putting in waters. I would have thought it would have given the same thing. Well, this is running pretty slow. Oh, it's done. Okay. Um, so, um, so that is an energy minimization, um, which is generally fairly fast compared to, uh, you know, compared to simulations. And the output of it includes um, most importantly, uh, em.grow, okay, which is the last, um, you know, which is the configuration that it made. Um, and there's this em.log, which is the log file that tells, you know, how long it took to run and so on. Um, but once you've done this energy minimization, then you're able to um, do the next step, right, which is to pre-process for the NVT run, because now you have the configuration you need. Um, 
And so uh, again, I can, I can type this in here. Right, so this is GMX Gromp. The input file is the MDP. The configuration file is em.grow. The topology file is system.tot. And the thing that we're making with this pre-processing is the output file nvt.ptr. And that's not good. Um, probably I forgot to copy pause read.itp into the ready to run. So maybe it should be called not quite ready to run. Um, let's see. The ITP file, the last lines need to be removed, which is not. Yeah, removed. but the MBT actually, I think, actually does the uses the position restraint. So I'm going to just copy that file from start into ready to run because it's in there. Um, uh, and then I'll try the command again. Okay, now it worked. And then I can submit to the queue. Uh, there's my script, mbt.sh. And just to show you what's in there, it's just the same sort of thing that we saw, basically a one line uh, Gromax command CDing into the working directory where the script was run when where, where the Q sub was when you when this was submitted. Um, so and then if I Q stat, I'll see that it's queued, but we'll be running soon. Okay. So while that's running, and I hope that it's running for everybody, is there anybody who's having, who's had trouble and not gotten that thing uh, submitted? If there are uh, people with having issues with that, please, please chat in. Okay, um, while we're waiting for those to finish, um, let me talk about the next uh, aspect, um, which is, you know, what you do when you have some results. So the first kind of thing you do is you want to make sure everything's okay. And the ways of doing that are, you know, if you were trying to equilibrate something and what you expect to see is that the energy is fluctuating along and not changing in time because that's the way equilibrium systems work. And likewise, that the pressure, if you had done a constant pressure run, would be fluctuating along and not doing anything special. Um, and that the density of the system likewise would be fluctuating along and not doing anything special. Of course, there'll be a transient of adjustment of the density from whatever it was you built, which may not be quite right, to the actual density when you do an NPT simulation and a transient of the temperature or of the energy, you know, would be certainly reasonable at the beginning, right? But you expect those things to go away. Um, the other thing that you might want to do and, and should do every time you start any kind of new simulation is just look at the movie. Um, and for this, we use this tool called uh, VMD. Um, it is a visual, obviously, <laughs> um, VMD stands for Visual Molecular Dynamics, I think. Um, it is a, a visual program with a graphical user interface and all that stuff. And, and therefore describing how to use it is a little, you know, it's one of those things where you'd need like multiple screenshots to, to describe how to use it. Or a YouTube video um, of which I prepared one a year or so ago and, and I sent um, a link that that was something that you might uh, want, to, want to look at. Um, here are, are some some sample results. Again, as I say, while we're while we're waiting for these with these runs to finish, um, 
and this shows what I was talking about there. There's the temperature rising up from from uh, from zero because this uh, this run started with no random velocities, and so the thermostat has to bring the kinetic energies up up from zero, and it quickly does so. Um, you can see the time in picoseconds down at the bottom. The whole NDT run that we're doing here is only a hundred picoseconds long, and within the first ten picoseconds, the temperature has has equilibrated pretty nicely. Um, and uh, likewise, if you look at the pressure, and this is from the NDT run that we have not yet submitted because we haven't done the, we haven't finished the NDT run, um, the pressure is fluctuating um, rather wildly around what looks like zero bar. And, and you might look at that and think that looks terrible, um, except that the kind of pressures that are at stake in a liquid are the internal pressures, the ones that have to do with how much the molecules stick to each other. Um, in other words, the pressure fluctuations are of the scale of the cohesive energy density. And those are big pressures compared to one bar. One bar is basically zero compared to the kind of pressures that liquids exert on themselves, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so the fact that these fluctuations are big is a consequence of that and that these systems are small. Um, the pressure fluctuations would scale like one over the square root of the number of particles, I think. Um, and so, you know, the fact that this is fluctuating around a constant smallish value is more or less what you expect to see. Um, likewise, the density in the uh, in the simulation. Uh, again, the, the NBT uh, simulation would have a perfectly flat density, but the NPT uh, simulation has a varying density because the volume is varying. And so you see the density fluctuating around about a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, which is, you know, which is water. And, and the, you know, if it's a little bit higher than that, I guess it's because it has a protein in it. Um, but basically it's fluctuating around the density of water. And, and finally, we have here a snapshot from the, uh, from the VMD uh, simulation of the protein itself all folded up uh, with its counter ions, those sort of cyan colored things of which you can see five of the moons of this, of the eight moons of this, uh, of this protein are hovering, you know, somewhere nearby. Um, so, um, so VMD, as I said, is a, is a uh, graphical user interface program launched from the command line, but it immediately opens windows. And, um, and so here I've got a couple of, of uh, screenshots of, of portions of it just to show you kind of how you, how you use it. Um, it takes a little bit of practice to become facile at, um, at it. Um, and, and facile here means making the, making the way that it looks so that you can see stuff. So the first thing is for some reason or other, it wakes up in um, with, with a perspective um, uh, versus orthographic um, depiction of the molecules. In other words, it's like it's really up close to you and you're seeing, you know, it's, it's, it's in your peripheral vision, like it wants you to fly into it or something. But what you really want, or at least what I typically want, is for it to be far away. So it just looks like a, you know, a chunk of stuff that's more or less cubic shaped. And so you change it to, to orthographic by changing the display. And then um, it wakes up with the, with the molecule um, drawn with sticks. And oftentimes what you want is something that's maybe a little more space filling and maybe you wanna control what thing is visible or not visible. So you go to the main menu graphics and representations, which is how the different atoms are represented. Okay, and, and so here, for example, I've changed the water so that I can't see it by choosing the, the residue name, res name, sol, that says all the things that are solvent, okay, are now drawn by the van der Waals VDW method. So that's gonna give like balls that are about the size of, of the excluded radius of the atoms. And then I scale those down really small and make them about 20%. And then I had this just little dusty, dusty water that lets me know there's water in there. Um, 
I want to see the protein, of course. And you can see in this picture right here that there's kind of a little thin place in the middle, right? Because I'm only showing the water right now. And so the thin place is where the protein is. Um, and so I make a second representation by creating a rep, a representation. And then that new one, I make be everything but the water. So not res name Saul. And, and you can imagine that there's a whole kind of language of how you select different atoms so that you can draw them differently. And here, all I do is just draw those also with van der Waals space filling spheres, but I set them to be full size. And, and in that way, I get that picture there, um, which shows the protein with the, with the water around it. And this is all, you know, well, let's just say my students are much, much better than I am at, at tweaking these pictures so that they, so that they look uh, glorious. Um, so the way VMD works is you, you load a grow file. So you say VMD and then the name of the grow file and you get this picture and you fiddle around with it in the way that I said. But what you really wanna see is the movie. And the way you get the movie in there is you load the trajectory onto the molecule that you brought in. And so the way that's done is highlighting the, the, um, the molecule in the quote unquote list of molecules, where there's only one here because we only loaded one. Um, and then from file, load data into molecule. And then you get a file browser, which you browse your way to the TRR file, which is the trajectory run file, the movie that we went to so much trouble to make. Um, and then you load that. Um, it's convenient to load it all at once rather than frame by frame, it's faster. So you click that little button and you do that. And then you have a movie which you can play by pushing the play button. So that's roughly how, how VMD uh, works. And, um, and so um, when you have a, a trajectory to look at, uh, you, can, you can look at it with with DMD. So, so now what I'm going to do, I guess, is I'm going to go over here and see how my, um, how my job is doing. Um, so if I QSTAT and be uh, me, uh, my job's running. Okay. Um, and now if I look in here, I can see nvt.log. And so I can VI that file just to look around in it. Um, and I go to the bottom. And I can see I'm, I'm 49 picoseconds into the run. Okay, so halfway done. Um, it's it's gonna be a 100 picosecond run. Um, and uh, let's see, um, maybe in the interest of time, uh, what we should do by way of just exploring the results is to CD over to the completed job Okay, um, where we can DMD stuff and, and use GMX energy and so on to, to look at the results. So everybody uh, CD into the, into the completed folder, okay, which, which you know, will be your examples, Liza's I'm completed. Okay, and let's, um, let's do the, uh, the, um, the GMX energy and um, to get the, uh, the temperature and pressure and density time series, and then, um, and then launch VMD and fool around with the, uh, with the visualizer, okay? So for this purpose, because VMD is kind of fiddly, um, I'm gonna put us back in breakout rooms. Um, one other comment is, the, um, the GMX energy program uh, utility is, is interactive and it will prompt you with a long list of things that it wants to know which of those you'd like to extract. And so generally what you're doing is you're extracting from the, from the energy data record file, EDR file, um, the data that you want into a, a, into a file that will be readable by XM Grace or other programs. It's, you know, it's a human readable file. Um, but it's directly set up with headers so that you can plot it uh, in XM Grace. So, so shift over to that part of the 
of the uh, of the exercise, and um, I'm going to put us all in breakout rooms again so that we can play with that a little bit. So the next topic that I want to spend the the, the final half hour of today, um, being being generous with myself to give myself an extra ten minutes for the ten minutes I squandered um, trying to figure out how to share my screen. Um, the, the, the last topic that I want to talk about is uh, for today is um, a little bit more about the kinds of measurements that um, that one can make um, using the the, uh, the standard suite of of Gromax uh, analysis tools, which are which are quite extensive. And this the, the things I'm going to talk about really only kind of scratch the surface of of the sorts of of things that you can do. And and these tools have in general been you know developed um, with common tasks in mind and you know and then one might ask the question well common tasks for who um, you know what kinds of measurements um, are repeatedly uh, done and you can learn a little bit about you know the community of people who who were involved in the development of this by looking at what the tools are but it's a, it's a broad suite in any case and um, and so um, the uh, I've put together a um, a set of of uh, examples that you can do based on uh, completed simulations, um, which I'm first going to talk about, and then I think you know, in the last few minutes, I'll just I'll set you loose into into breakout rooms <clears throat> to try some of them out. But they're really rather simple uh, by comparison to what you've just, <clears throat> just done. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, a simple example that actually has a lot of physics in it. Um, is a simulation of salt water, or you know, an, an ionic solution. Um, and um, I mean, here are just a couple of the things that you can that you could measure about such a uh, such a system. <coughs> it's it's heat capacity, um, certainly by looking at at energy fluctuations. It's dielectric constants, interesting too, because um, the dielectric constant of water being high comes from the fact that it has dipoles that can be reoriented partially by an applied electric field. And so if you put ions uh, in salt water, um, then the dipoles of the water are to a fair degree um, oriented toward the nearest ion or away from it, depending on the sign of the ion. Uh, and so um, di the dipole, um, the ability of that dipole then to then respond to a weak electric field is diminished because it's it's basically already committed to to pointing uh, you know to solvating the ions, um, and so there's a tool for for measuring dielectric constant and, and it's kind of interesting to apply to salt water as opposed to pure water. Um, you can measure structural correlation functions and salt solutions up, you know are a perfectly nice example of that because you can ask you know how near are the sodiums to the sodiums and how near are the sodiums to the chlorines and how near are the chlorines to the chlorines and so on um, and as you might expect the sodiums tend to avoid the sodiums and the chlorines the chlorines but the sodiums tend to hang around the chlorines uh, quite a lot and you can see this in the pair correlation function um, you can also watch the ions diffuse around either on their own just without any applied field or you can watch them drift uh, in an applied field um, and um, and one of the things you learn when you when you do that is that if you put a field on you know, of course the sodiums drift one way and the chlorines drift the other way and the water moves a little bit too uh, which is electrophoresis and, and and the reason the water moves is because the mobility of the sodium is a little bit higher than the chlorine or the other way around I can't remember which and, and so when you, when you apply an electric field, you're not applying a net force to the system because you're pushing one way on the, on the positive ions and the other on the negative. So if one of those drifted faster than the other, the water would have to move to make up the difference so that the, you know, so that the net momentum of the system wasn't all drifting off to the left or the right. And all these things can be seen um, using these standard analysis tools. So I, I'm not going to describe really how these simulations were, were done, except to say that, you know, for example, the salt water system is built pretty much the way that the Lysozyme example was. You, you make a box of water, you put a few ions in there, and, and you're good to go. Um, but uh, here's the kind of thing that you can, you can measure. So for example, here are 
mean squared displacements of the water, the sodium, and the chlorine versus time, and they grow linearly versus time, as you might expect um, for a diffusing quantity. And, and the two commands that allow you to, to see this are, are listed above. So the GMX, the GROMAX tool is MSD for mean squared displacement. Um, it's, you know, it's this, I mean, it's the same old thing. Eventually you realize kind of what the, what the conventions are with respect to the command line arguments. Hyphen F is the input file, which is clearly going to be a movie. So a topology run, a, a TRR file. Um, anytime you need a TRR file, you need a topology run file to interpret it. And so you have hyphen, hyphen S for structure, uh, the TPR file. And then the output hyphen O is an XVG file, which will be plottable. And this mean square displacement tool is interactive. So it will ask you what it is you want the MSD of, you know, and, and you tell it a number and, and then it does its thing. Um, and then you, you plot that thing uh, with X and grace. And, and here, what I've done is actually done MSD three times to make the mean square displacement for the sodium, for the chlorine, and for the water. And then if you X and grace three XVG files at once, they all get plotted together with different colors and legend and everything. So it's, it's convenient, right? Um, on the, on the right here, you see, you know, similar thing with the radial distribution function, the pair correlation function. And, and there you see, as you might well expect, that there's a whacking big correlation peak for the sodiums to sit next to the chlorines, right? The G of R is telling you the relative concentration, the, the ratio of concentration of, of the particle you're looking for around the particle you're sitting on relative to the average concentration. So if I sit on a chlorine, I look for a sodium or vice versa at a given distance r, how many times more likely am I to find one relative to the average concentration? That's what G of r is telling you. And so all these functions go to one at far distances because at far distances, you don't know that there was a, a sodium sitting here when you go look for a chlorine over there. But close up, you absolutely do. And so there's a great big peak um, for for nearby um, for nearby chlorines to a sodium, um, whereas if you look at the sodium sodium or chlorine chlorine, what you see is a hole, basically a place where it's kind of zero. Um, sodiums don't like to sit next to sodium, certainly not within a solvation shell, and so there's a great big hole where the peak was in the in the sodium chlorine, and so you know you find out about local structure, and this is just a, a simple example, um, and the functions to do that are basically as simple as the MSD one, right? It's GMX RDF. Again, the input file is the movie, the topology run file. You have to give it the, the, the topology structure file, the S file, and the output is a, is a correlation function. And then you, you view that with X and grace, here are three, three of them at once. And um, RDF is an interactive thing as well because you gotta tell it you know, what thing it is you want to correlate with what. So you make two choices of a number in response to a, um, to a query. Um, and then here are two other things that you can, that you can do. Um, so as I mentioned, and that this is a, a sort of a new thing that we haven't talked about yet, and you can run simulations with external fields applied, and in particular with an electric field applied. That's an option that you've got to tell it in the MDP file. It's a condition of the run. You know, please put a field on. Um, once you've done that, then you discover your ions don't diffuse anymore. They drift, right? So they have a, a steady drift. And the tool for observing that drift is TRAJ for trajectory. And the TRAJ tool, um, with somewhat fancier command line options, um, can tell you um, about the steady motion of, of, the, of the particles that you're asking about. And so that command up there, GMX traj, is uh, with its command options is what you need in order to measure the steady drift of the sodium and the chlorine. And um, if you look closely, you'll discover that the water is drifting ever so slightly uh, in, in one direction. Um, not very big, okay, but the, the right-hand side of that line is a little bit higher than the left-hand side of that line. 
um, and that's um, that's electrophoresis. If the ions were, you know, physicist ions, like equal and opposite charge spheres of exactly the same size in a structureless liquid, this wouldn't happen, right? Because there'd be symmetry. The, the positive charge would drift exactly the same speed one way as the negative charge did the other way. Um, and finally, um, you can find out about dielectric response, um, interestingly, by watching the dipoles fluctuate. So this is a sort of a subject that would take a few minutes to explain, but but there's a thing called the fluctuation dissipation theorem, um, which says if you watch something fluctuate and it fluctuates a lot, then it's easier to bias that thing by putting on a weak field. And so there's a relation between how much a thing fluctuates and how easily it would respond to an applied field. Um, so another name for the fluctuation dissipation theorem is the fluctuation response theorem. It says those two things are related. Um, and so um, what you measure is the fluctuation of the system dipole, adding up all the water dipoles in the system. In any given little moment, the dipole might point this way or that way or the other way, and it dances around randomly in the absence of any applied field. And if you watch that random dance of the dipole moment, of which the three colored plots are the X, Y, Z components of it, then you can infer as this tool GMX dipoles does, uh, how big the dielectric constant is. And so um, here what I've done is use that tool GMX dipoles to extract that information. The, the dielectric constant gets printed out in the, in the printout to the screen when you use the tool, um, which of course you could save to a file by, by redirecting it into a file with you know, greater than the way you use you know, for output redirection in, in Unix to some file name. Um, and then here I've just plotted the, the, uh, the dipole fluctuations just so I can see what they look like. And they're pretty because there's four colors. Um, the answers uh, that come out of this are um, uh, a dielectric constant of water if you do it pure of, of 62, which is a little low compared to real water, uh, which is more like 70 something, um, but not bad and, and basically a um, a testimony to the decency of, of this water model. Because remember, this is not real water. We're simulating it's all fake and lies. Uh, and so, you know, the potentials need to be good in order for the quantities to be, to be meaningful. But it's not bad. Uh, but what's interesting is that this concentrated salt solution, which is something like one molar salt, I mean, I put a lot of ions in this thing, has, has a dielectric constant that's a lot lower. Um, and it's because the dipoles are spending a lot of their time pointed toward or near or, or away from, if it's the opposite sign of ion, uh, the ions in the solution. And so they're not fluctuating as much as they would otherwise. And if they don't fluctuate as much, then you can't bias them as strongly with a given weak field. And that's that fluctuation response theorem again. So the amplitude of the dipole fluctuations in the salt water is less than it would, would be in the pure water. And the corresponding dielectric constant is smaller. Uh, so that's you know an example of of things that you can um, that you can measure out of out of uh, salt water. Um, a different uh, system, uh, just while I'm on the topic of of measurements, um, is um, to do with interfaces. So suppose you want to know about um, interfacial tension of water against its vapor, or effectively against vacuum. Um, you can simulate a slab of water. And here, you know, we've got a little slab of water. And remember, we have periodic boundary conditions. So this slab wraps around in the transverse direction. Um, we do this simulation um, at fixed geometry of the cell, but the simulation is able, as it were, to feel the, the uh, liquid pulling on the walls of the box, because you could lower the, um, the free energy of the system, you might say, if the area were smaller. And, and the way that that um, is, um, how should I say, uh, exemplified in the simulation is that, um, is that the, um, the pressure in the different directions is different. Um, and so it's possible to measure the, the inward pressure on the walls of the box. So you set up this slab of water simply by, by making a box of water um, 
and then expanding the dimensions of the box in the, in the z direction so that there's a big region of vacuum. So that's this two lines here are describing how that thing is built. You, you build a box of water with solvate and then you edit the configuration with edit conf to make the box taller and then you have a slab. And when you do that, um, you can then um, you can then observe, um, and this is, is done with um, GMX energy to pull off this particular piece of information, this, this pressure differential that tells you about the interfacial tension. Um, and what you see is a, is a strongly fluctuating thing with a non-zero average. And, and the interpretation of this is the interfacial tension times the number of interfaces. And here there's two, because there's a top and a bottom of this, of this slab. And if you, if you remember that one bar nanometer is a tenth of a millimeton per meter, or equivalently a tenth of an erg per square centimeter, uh, anyway, surface tension unit, um, then you can read off the surface tension of this thing, divide by two, and, and lo and behold, it's pretty close to water. Um, and of this slab, another thing that one can measure is the density profile, which is you know, an interesting thing that has many uses, but you can see you know, how sharp is the interface between water and, and, and its vacuum or vapor, and, and the answer is pretty sharp. Um, and you know, the density in the middle is very, um, very characteristic of bulk water very soon. If you had a liquid that was you know, closer to miscibility, if you had like a liquid-liquid interface, then you'd see a significant profile here as the two things were, were intermixing transiently all you know, on their way to immiscibility, so to speak. And so measuring that is a, you know, could be a quite interesting interfacial probe of liquid-liquid interfaces. And that's, that's done with this command GMX density, um, which with various options reads the density profile of some quantity or other. Again, it's an interactive thing. So you have to tell it what you want the density of um, in different directions and then can be plotted again with, with XM Grace. Um, so that's kind of a whirlwind tour of, of some of the kind of measurements that one can do. Um, and I will close the, um, the evening or morning, depending on where you are, um, by putting us in, in breakout rooms to just play with this a little bit. Um, don't have to do them all. You can pick, you know, pick some measurement or other and, and, uh, and plot it. So the, the instructions for doing that are in the line by line instructions, which I'm now going to, um, to share my screen and then highlight briefly. Um, so they are, are here. Um, and it's just in each case, it's, you know, it's one GMX measurement or analysis command uh, followed by one uh, XM grace command. Or in the case of these ones where it's, it's multiple mean squared displacements, you have to do this thing uh, three times, you know, to get first the sodium MSD, then the, then the chlorine, then the water, and then, and then you plot them together. So, so these are the instructions. This kind of stuff is pretty straightforward uh, compared to the, the more fiddly things involved in, in building and running a simulation. And it's actually one of the nice, uh, nice features about Gromax uh, is that it has actually a quite good suite of, of analysis programs. So I will, um, set you loose uh, into breakout rooms and, um, and uh, just we'll just take a few minutes to explore that because the hour is late. Um, and, um, and I'll bid you a, a good evening and good morning in advance. I won't pull you back uh, into the plenary session, so to speak. Okay, so I'm just gonna set up breakout rooms and, uh, and we'll stick around and play with this for, for you know, however long you want to, but you know, 10, 15 minutes something like that. Okay. So any, any last questions before I